Hi, welcome to chapter 3, Population Composition. In this chapter, we are going to learn what composes a population, meaning what are the ingredients of a population. Just like you have ingredients for a dish that you would like, similarly a given population has certain ingredients as well. We are going to learn what they are. So population basically means people, and people have basic attributes like what their occupation is, what have they studied, that is their education, qualification, and what their life expectancy is, that is depending on which part of the world they stay and how much developed it is in terms of technology and medical discoveries. In a nutshell, we're going to read all these stuffs. So the first topic is sex composition. The ratio between the number of women and men in the population is called the sex ratio. So how do we calculate it? We find the number of women in particular place and then the number of men we will then divide women with men and then multiply with 1000. The sex ratio is an important information about the status of women in a country. So we can conclude by saying that places where sex ratio is not in favor of women, such areas are those where the practice of female feticide, female infanticide and domestic violence against women is common. And these all problems are outcomes of low socioeconomic status of women meaning women in these places have not been empowered enough to stand up for their rights. So we need to keep in mind the problems as well as its reasons why it's happening. Just to present a little factual data, most of the Asian countries have low sex ratio, meaning women are lesser in number to men. Countries like China, India, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan have a lower sex ratio. And if you go to Russia and countries of Europe, there the males are in minority, meaning that the status of women is much better. And the reason behind that we will read about later on going forward. So for now, have a generalist idea about all of this. Now let's read about how age structure can help us in understanding the population. Age structure tells us how many people belong to what age group. And knowing this is really important and you will get to know why in a moment. I want you to think about this. In India, the working population is in the age group of 15 to 59 years. By 15, you'll have your basic schooling done and many join the government services. And by 60, you will retire from whatever that you were doing. Now, people above 60 years are aging population, which requires more expenditure on health care facilities, pensions, etc. So by knowing the age structure, government can allocate resources efficiently, both for the younger ones and the elders. Similarly, high proportion of young population would mean that the region has a high birth rate and the population is youthful. Therefore, more schemes can be developed for this category of the population. This is how age structure plays an important role which enables us to understand and compare data which will then provide insights for better decision making. Now, what do we mean by age sex pyramid? It simply refers to the number of females and males in different age groups. Good amount of information about the population is broken down by age and sex and it can be read from a population pyramid. Now it also tells us how a population changes over time. By that I mean what's the birth rate, death rate and life expectancy of a country. So here's a picture of India's population pyramid and I will outline few information that will make you understand the whole age sex pyramid concept better. Now if you look at this picture, this is what a population pyramid looks like and this figure is especially about India. Bars in the blue represent male population and bars in the red represents female population. In the vertical axis you have the age and in the horizontal axis you have the population in millions. Now if you look at the age group of 0 to 14 years, their population bar is extremely high and they are also known as the dependent generation meaning they are living with their parents, guardians and are mostly dependent on them for resources. And now look at the age group of 15 to 59 years. So this entire group is known as the working population, meaning they are the number of people who are willing and eligible to work. So these are the people who are working, generating income, paying taxes and running the nation's economy. So all the budget for government policies and schemes Everything has to be generated from this lot because these are the ones who pay taxes and from the tax money budget is allocated. And now look at the age group of people above 59 years. These are the older populations. 
Now this population will require more expenditure on healthcare facilities, pensions and all other care and welfare. So there is a lot that can be figured out by looking at the population pyramid. We can also predict the potential political issues. For example, the rapid growth of young adult population who are not able to find employment can lead to unrest. So by looking at this pyramid, we can predict that what is the amount of people who are going to pass out from colleges or schools next year and who will need job and employment. Then the government can figure out how to create jobs, how to put this young adult population into working force. And these are few of the things that can be figured out by looking at the population pyramid. So I hope now you are well aware of how this population pyramid works. Now we're going to read about rural urban composition. The rural and urban lifestyles are totally different from each other in many ways like in terms of the way they live and their social conditions, their age, sex, occupational structure, they are different in density of population and level of development. So there is a big difference in rural and urban areas. Now we know that rural people are engaged in primary activities and in urban areas majority of the working population is engaged in non-primary activities. So if you look at this picture you can see rural urban sex composition of six countries. And if you see Canada and Finland, they are totally opposite of Zimbabwe and Nepal. In Canada and Finland, which are western countries, here males outnumber females in rural areas and females outnumber the males in urban areas. And the reason is here the females have moved from rural to urban areas for more job opportunities and farming in these developed countries is also highly mechanized and remains largely a male occupation. Whereas if you see in India, female participation in farming activity in rural areas is fairly high and the urban areas are male dominated. I hope you are seeing a contrast in the sex ratio of western and Asian countries. And the next topic is literacy. Knowing the literacy rate of a population in a country tells a lot about its socio-economic condition, standard of living, social status of females, availability of educational facilities and policies of government. Now in India, literacy rate means the percentage of people above 7 years of age who can read, write and can do a little math with understanding. If a person can do all of this, we call them literate. And the last topic of this video is occupational structure. This is another important key indicator of a working population. Whenever we say working population, we are referring to the people of the age group of 15 to 59 years who are engaged in primary, secondary, tertiary or quaternary occupation that can range from agriculture, forestry, fishing, manufacturing, construction, transport services, communication and many other services. Now you must be thinking how occupational structure is a key indicator. What do we learn from it? Well, think of it this way. If you can find out what percentage of working population is engaged in secondary, tertiary or quaternary sector, then by identifying what type of jobs fall in these categories, let me give you an example. Jobs in manufacturing, industries and infrastructure comes under secondary, tertiary and quaternary sector. So by knowing this piece of information, we can easily say that, look, so-and-so country has a major percentage of people engaged in secondary, tertiary and quaternary sector. And these sectors contribute tremendously to the nation's GDP. And that means the country has a developed economy. I hope you are getting how occupational structure helps in determining a key aspect of nation's economy. So an economist looks into all these key indicators and forms a theory based on the outcome. And these theories are then supported by government spending in the form of schemes and policies. With this, we have come to an end of this chapter. I hope you found this video informative. As usual, let me know your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoy these videos and see a purpose behind watching them, please like the video and comment down below. Until then, catch you guys later and talk to you guys on the next one. Peace.